Let me pray real quick. Lord, thank you for your hand upon our lives, Lord. If, if it were just us, we would be um, lost in the ocean of madness. But you're the rock, Lord, on which we stand. And you bring stabilizing, settling reality to our lives. And Lord, you give us purpose. You give us hope. Lord, I just ask that you'd speak to us on that individual level that only you're able to do today. As we open your scriptures, that you would be honored as we go through the passages and that you would meet us heart to heart. Help us to have hearing hearts, Lord, to receive the nugget of truth you have for me, the nugget of truth you have for any individual listening. And Lord, that you would be glorified in it all. Thank you, Lord, for the the morsels that we can live on in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. So I asked Tim, since I'm teaching uh, two weeks in a row, I said, okay, Tim, I don't want to get outside of what your heart is as pastor, so what do you want me to do today? Because I, I can come up with one thing last week, that's fine. But I said, I don't want to get it derailed apart from what your heart is for the body and uh, so he asked me to go back to Daniel chapter 1. We did Daniel chapter 1 a couple weeks ago in the men's group. And uh, he said he's been thinking about it ever since. So he wanted me to just kind of share with the body on a wider scale and maybe uh, expand that blessing of what, what God did in our hearts as men that day. So if you're unfamiliar with Daniel, I'll give you a little bit of background. Daniel, the book of Daniel in the group of Jewish writings is not included in the prophets, which is kind of interesting because we include him in the evangelical world. We include him in the, in the major prophets with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel will be the block of major prophets and then the 12 minor prophets after that. But in the Jewish writings, they didn't view Daniel as a prophetic book. They viewed it as a writing like First and Second Chronicles almost an historical book without much prophetic impact, which is kind of interesting because as I study um, not just Daniel, but some of the other prophets, prophets and prophecies in general, Daniel and Revelation are intricately linked. And that's a, uh, that's a reality that you can't get around. There are too many references back and forth. And um, as I began diving into Daniel, there's quite a bit, quite a bit to kind of grasp in terms of what was Daniel about? Who was he? What kind of a guy was he? And we have all of his, bio, his biography or even God specifically saying what kind of a guy he was. And he's one of the few characters in the Bible that doesn't have anything negative, which is interesting. It's like, oh, that feels like it's unattainable. <laughs> but um, So let's dive into it. Matthew 24, we have Jesus's commentary on Daniel, Matthew 24, 15. He says, uh, Daniel the prophet. So if Jesus says he's Daniel the prophet, then I'll go with Daniel as a prophet. And that's my starting point. Daniel's a prophet. The Jewish rabbis may not have recognized it, but Jesus established that as part of who he was. Daniel was a prophet. So we can start with that basis. So Daniel also was of nobility and possibly of the king's lineage. He may have been a descendant, well, he probably was a descendant of Hezekiah. King Hezekiah and the kings of Judah from there, Josiah and Jeconiah, he might have been one of those grandchildren or nephews in the line of Hezekiah. Why is Hezekiah important? Uh, if you go to Isaiah 39, you might remember Hezekiah was sick later in life. And he was kind of like I do sometimes. He was bawling on his bed. What was me? Life is horrible. If only I had a few more years. This is where Hezekiah was at. And he didn't want to yield. And he began asking God to spare him. So God yielded and God gave him 15 additional years. God said, okay, I'm going to give you 15 more. And Hezekiah was rejoicing in it. So much so that in, in the Isaiah 39, he kind of lost his marbles and he forgot that he's the king. And there are like state secrets he needs to be aware of. 
So when the emissaries from Babylon heard that Hezekiah had been miraculously healed, they sent get well wishes with a handful of spies. And the spies were really crafty, and they came in and started asking questions like, oh, wow, it's really cool. That you're, you know, what else do you have around? And we see some of these statues and stuff. So Hezekiah essentially opened, he opened the Fort Knox of Israel and, and showed these guys everything. He didn't hold anything back. So they saw all of the temple treasures, all of the wealth of Israel. And then they said, oh, we'll see you later. And at that time, Babylon was just like a little know-nothing kind of city in the far east. And that's where Isaiah, or that's where Hezekiah was coming from and thinking, what's the big whoop, right? They're just a bunch of guys and it's like a small little town in Nowheresville. But Isaiah comes in shortly after that. He sees the donkeys and the camels heading out. He says to Hezekiah, who are these guys? It's like, ah, oh, they're just guys, well-wishers from Babylon. He's like, what did you show them? I showed them everything. What's the big deal? And in, 30, in Isaiah, Isaiah 39, if you go to verse 5, Isaiah speaks to Hezekiah and says, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day, it's all going to be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And they'll take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Here's Hezekiah's response to this. Would that be heartbreaking news? Your sons, your grandsons are going to be taken away captive. Here's Hezekiah's response, and this is a little indicator. Hezekiah did not finish well. The goal is to finish well, guys. If you, don't, if you aren't there yet, you want to finish well. You can have a, a, a smooth sailing walk with the Lord through the intermediate years, but you've got, you've got to have a heart to finish well. Hezekiah's mistake is, he's like, I, I did my time. I'm good. I've got 15 years to go. I'm, I'm, I'm all in for me now. And he says, the word of the Lord, which you said is good. Hezekiah speaking to Isaiah. And he said, well, at least there'll be peace in my days. He doesn't, he's not concerned about the generations to come. And I think from, from that standpoint, Hezekiah is flippant about, about, oh, that scared me, train coming by. Hezekiah is flippant about the impact of his decisions on future generations. And he's not thinking that through, he's not aware of that. So that's like point one today, maybe don't be a Hezekiah and finish poorly and not think about your impact. You can leave an impact for good or an impact that derails the generations to come. So I want to, I want to leave an impact and a heritage for my kids and their kids. So so that's the setup to Daniel. So when we get to Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, there are multiple passages in Jeremiah and Isaiah that warn of this coming takeover of Judah. Warnings are coming. They're coming. Repent. Deal with the sin. Jeremiah, over and over, if you repent, draw near. God will forgive you. But the warnings are coming, and eventually Jeconiah is the king, and Jeconiah has the words like, you're going to be the last king. You're going to be cut off. That's it. And God's given that word to Jeconiah. Meanwhile, Jeconiah is the king. But he's going to be the last king of Judah. So this is in the third year of the reign of Je Jehoiakim, who was Jeconiah's father. Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So there were three different waves of the Babylonian um, attacks. And this was the first of three. By the third one, everybody and everything is carted off to Babylon. Nothing's left behind. Handful of people out on the farmland, but the city's leveled. All the treasures are gone and everything is taken. This is the first wave where it's a little bit like Rome in, in Israel where maybe Nebuchadnezzar was thinking, I'll just set up kind of a puppet government, leave everybody in place, but I'm going to take the boys of the nobility and I'm going to train them and prepare them. But by the time that training and preparation is done, it's already rebellion in Jerusalem. He's like, oh, let's just wipe them out. So that, that first initial plan is what we're talking about right here. He's thinking maybe we'll just 
take a handful of them in some of the articles. So Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he besieged it, 606 B.C. So Isaiah was written around 710, 715 B.C., so a full hundred years prior. Hezekiah is told Babylon's going to come and wipe it out. A hundred years later, Babylon's at the doorstep. So from Hezekiah to Daniel and the boys who are taken, we have a hundred years. So how many generations? Three to four, right? So they're, they're going to be young men. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. So this is, this is kind of the storehouse where later on uh, Belshazzar is throwing the feast and he pulls out the goblets. This is where he's got them. They've already been stored from the first wave. So they're just kind of camped out in the, in the temple of Babylon. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel, some of the king's descendants, and some of the nobles. And he wanted young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand. And they had the ability to serve in the king's palace, whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. So young men in that day and age would be probably 14, 15, 16 years old. Uh, young men that you think, well, if we can get them young enough, we can kind of fashion them into like uh, almost like a, a transition between the two cultures. And we can prepare them to serve in both and maybe lead in Israel according to how we want them to lead. We'll plant them back there. And that was the notion. Um, and it might have worked had these guys not had incredible training and a godly heritage. Somehow, from Hezekiah to Manasseh to Jehoiakim and Jeconiah, Manasseh was actually the one that had the, the greatest swing from complete wickedness to a turn and a radical end to his life. Hezekiah, Hezekiah kind of slowly wound his life down. But there wasn't necessarily a um, a dynamic presence. Now Josiah was in the middle of there, and Josiah may have had the biggest impact. But these guys are still pretty young. So these young men would have been around 15, 14, 15, 16, maybe. So imagine if, if you can, being 15, taken hostage perhaps, Kidnapped, if you want to term it that way. But with good intentions. We're, just, we're, just, we're actually going to feed you really well. We're going to take care of you. It's okay. You might actually get to come back in three or four years for the king's purposes. So what begins happening is there's this subtle indoctrination, this subtle argument towards it's for your own good. It's actually for your benefit that you come with us and, and learn our ways. And it's a real... it's a, It's a real subtle, I think it's a subtle lie that the world tells us to. Just compromise a little bit. It's good. It'll be all right. It's actually for your benefit that you do some of these things that we do. So this is kind of where it's coming from. And understand, we have to have, uh, we talk about our, our spiritual spidey senses, right? We have to be kind of on alert for those kinds of lies. Because those lies will sink our walk with Christ. If we begin the compromise, the compromise goes further than you ever thought it would go. And it'll hold you longer than you thought you'd stay. And it'll cost you more than you thought you'd ever have to pay. Because the compromise is just the first step and it'll keep you on this trajectory that it'll be very difficult to pull out of on your own. So the literature of the Chaldeans, the language of the Chaldeans, what's, what's bad about that? The literature and the language is all good. But if it's rolled into the mindset and the spiritual condition of the Chaldeans, now you're talking trouble. Now you're in real trouble. So if you're not aware, ancient Babylon was the fountain of what we learn is the mystery religions that the Gnosticism and all of the ancient 
Um, ancient religions kind of Babylon was the fountain of all that, where it all it was the source of everything. That was sort of the anti to a biblical worldview. Babylon would be the direct opposite of that. And these guys are going right into the heart of it. And they're going to be under the influence of it for three years, it says. So verse 5. The king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank. And three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. So here's the test right out of the gate. And we talk about this a little bit with the young men, but I think it's for anybody. Are you aware that the test is even presented before you? Or is the test too subtle that you just go along and now you've already failed it and you're, you're caught? So what David, and the, what David and the other guys were dealing with is the king is going to supply all of their needs. They're not going to have anything to worry about. They're not going to be concerned about anything. And in fact, they're actually going to train them and, and prepare them for good things. You can serve the king. Not everybody gets to serve the king, but you guys can. Only you have to go through this program with us. And this is interesting because it begins, um, begins kind of setting up boundaries and lines. And if, if we're kind of aware of things around us, the freedom to worship God and then the boundaries that are set become tests. And at what point do you speak and take a stand? So there's a little bit of this uh, hint from the guys as they're entering into this situation It's a thousand miles from Jerusalem. They're disconnected from all their mentors, all the people who raised them, all the people who had influence in their lives. And now here we are, they're planted within the king's palace and they're on their own. So they're on their own. So now what? This is one of those chapters that a lot of youth ministries will teach at a, at a youth camp. Dare to be a Daniel. You know, um, purpose in your heart, all that kind of stuff. But it doesn't just relate to youth. It relates to everybody because you, you have to actually purpose in your heart. I'm not going to take the bait. So the guys, when we get down to verse 5, now among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. So then the chief of the eunuchs gave names. So the first step in the indoctrination is we're going to disconnect you from your God-given names. The names each had something to do with um, El, El, meaning God in Hebrew, or Yah, which is Yahweh in Hebrew. And if you read those names, they each have some indication, a servant of Yahweh. Yahweh is great. Yahweh is strong. And, and what they did is they gave them Babylonian names that linked them to Babylonian gods. So they they tried to cut out from them their relation by name to Yahweh and link them now to these Babylonian false gods. So that's step one. They're trying to give them a new identity. You're not a servant of Yahweh. You're a servant of of Shak, Shadrach, you know, Meshach, that idea. Verse 8, but Daniel, and that's what the world does, doesn't it? The world tries to test our identity. The world, the world tries to press our identity. How do you identify yourself? Am I, am I a child of God? Or am I what the world says I am? And it's all over the place, isn't it? Social media, everything begins to try and press us into the world's mold. Romans talks about not being conformed to the things of this world, but being transformed, being being set apart as God has called you. But man, it's easy because there are a lot of voices coming at us, right? Is it just me? Are there a lot of voices pressing us? Understanding your identity is, is key to understanding your calling. These guys understood their identity wasn't going to be changed because they changed their name. In um, Daniel in verse 8, He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. He would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine. So delicacies could be translated meat. 
meat wasn't always available. A lot of times meat was available for a feast a handful of times a year. In a Jewish culture, they would, they would kill the fatted calf and have a feast and have the whole village over for a wedding or a baby or um, you know a celebration. But, but it wasn't all the time. Like we're, we're so spoiled in our culture to have meat all the time. But these guys, it was a special thing. But at the king's table, it could be every day. And that's a whole different ballgame. So you have two elements. It's a little bit like it's uncommon dietary. And it might shock the system on one hand. But you also have the, the layer of they probably had pork because pork was a, okay. But it wasn't okay in the Jewish diet. And there were a lot of other things that weren't okay according to the Mosaic Law that might have been fully available at the king's table. So before you get into the situation of, okay, here's the, here's the opportunity in front of you, you have to kind of step back and, and plan ahead. This is what Daniel gives us a great example. He's 15, 16 years old. He says, hey guys, I think what they're talking about, it might be meat, it might be something wacky, it might be something against the law. He's like, I'm going to purpose in my heart, I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to do it ahead of time, before it's offered. And the four of them essentially make a pact. They're like, all right, we're all in it together. Daniel, you've got it. I think you're right on. We're all in it together. And we understand it wasn't just these four, but there were a multitude of these young men who were brought, and they were essentially going to sift them. And they're going to sift them and see which ones rise to the top, and those are the ones they're going to focus on. And we're told of these guys because God had his hand on these four and uh, it's a surprise, I think, to King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of the chapter that they're the ones who rose to the top. But we know God's hand is on them, okay? So we know the end from the beginning. But in the process of it, Daniel not only planned ahead, he kind of, he kind of laid the groundwork for, all right, this is, this is how I'm going to approach it. This is the game plan. I can't go that route. So what do I do instead? I'm going to purpose, I'm not going to go there, and if I have a chance, I'm going to say something. And this is interesting. He's not going to, with the wine which they drank, therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, if the king says, I'm going to provide it all, that might come with a, a consequence that if they reject it, they die. So when Daniel makes the request, he's making the request without knowing what might be the response. You understand? Nebuchadnezzar, we're told later on in chapter 2, he is the head of gold. Nobody says no to Nebuchadnezzar. And what Nebuchadnezzar says goes. But Daniel steps into it. He's like, you know what? At the cost of maybe my life, I'm going to say I'm not eating it. And I'm going to take the consequence, whatever it is, but I'm not eating it. Now what we know from the rest of the book of Daniel is this is a foreshadow for these four young men of what's coming. If they don't do the small thing with the diet and the food, they're not going to do the bigger test with the fiery furnace and the lion's den and praying when all, all the people are watching. The tests are coming and they're going to get bigger. But if you fail in the first test, how do you do the next one? How do you walk it out now? There's, they're kind of setting the course for their, we're told in the New Testament, for their conversation, their lifestyle in Babylon. We're to have a conversation that's different from the world around us. The idea of the conversation being, how do we present ourselves both spoken and unspoken in this world? These guys are setting the course for their conversation in Babylon that it's not going to be normal. It's not going to be meek. It's not going to be run over by the king's wishes. So the eunuch is hesitant. The, the, the leader of the eunuchs is hesitant. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. So they traveled a thousand miles. There's a lot of communication even going on in that thousand mile journey. And by the time they arrive, it's like, I really like these guys. These are cool dudes. So a eunuch would probably be, um, we're told in, in the New Testament, they were either by the hands of men or by, by will or by natural birth. A eunuch would not be a threat to the king and the king's harem all that stuff, he was not sexually active. And this guy is kind of in charge of all these young men, 
but he's just training them and preparing them to serve before the king. And part of that, the eunuch is, the, this leader of the eunuchs, he's responsible directly to the king now. And he's going to answer to the king if these Hebrew kids all of a sudden start getting frail and you know, getting sick and all this kind of stuff. And he's expecting they're all just going to jump in and jump on board because this is the king's table. What are you guys thinking? So he's hesitant. He's like, man, you guys are going to get me in big trouble. So he didn't want to just shout him down and, and throw down on Daniel right away. But he's, he says to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, though. It's going to get me in trouble. He's appointed your food and drink. And why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you'd put me in danger. And I might be the one getting killed. And Daniel doesn't dismiss that. But he's like, well, God gives Daniel wisdom in the argument. And this is what will happen. If you take a stand and you purpose in your heart, God begins to give you wisdom and how, and, and we're promised that. That he'll give you the words to say in the moment. Daniel has the words to say in the moment exactly for the wisdom that's needed. He's like, how about this? What if we just do a test? Ten days. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over them, please, let, please test your servants for ten days. What if they just give us vegetables to eat and water to drink and see how we do? Ten days doesn't seem like a very long time, but it's interesting that it's all it took. Because within 10 days, the other Hebrew children were just like wrecked. So it didn't have to be this extended test. And sometimes God just needs a window to prove himself on your behalf. And he sets you free from the entanglements of it, right? And this is, this is where God is going to bless. So he's like, after 10 days, let, let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And then do as you see fit. Deal with your servants however you want. Like, if, if that's the case, then force us. Try and force us. Kill us, whatever it is. But Daniel and the other three are willing to step into a test like this. Why? They submitted their lives and their heart to the Lord. And no different than the fiery furnace, the speech they give at the fiery furnace later. It's like, whether or not he delivers us, we're not bowing. Whether or not our test comes out good, we're not eating it. That's where they're at. The line is firm. The line is clear. And there's no yielding in that. And it's amazing that these guys, they're young guys. When I was 15, I was wishy-washy. I wanted to help. I wanted to please people. I wanted to say the right thing. I wanted to do the right, whatever kind of got me out of the pressure of stuff. That's the experience of youth, right? Something's different in these guys. They, ro they rose above that common lane of youth. The presence of God will help you rise above that common lane of youth. Junior high is miserable. I hated it. High school is even worse. I hated that. But, but in, in the context of this, these guys are apart from mentors, apart from spiritual overseers, apart from anyone who can give them input in how do you deal with the situation. It reminds me a little bit of Jesus when he's confronted by the Pharisees. If I'm reading the arguments the Pharisees bring, I'm like, whoa, I don't even know what I would say to that. But Jesus is like, boom, gotcha. Puts them in a corner. They can't get out of the argument. They realize they've lost the argument. But Jesus is able to maneuver that in our heart and in our lives as well. Because he promises to give us the words in the moment. And we don't have to fear or fret that. So the, um, the head of the eunuchs in verse 14, he consented. He's like, oh, 10 days. I could probably float it for 10 days. Let's see. Right? He's like, okay. He didn't go to the king and ask for permission, but he feels like 10 days I can probably float that and get by and not get in too much trouble. And maybe he's expecting not a lot will be different and he's got him on the hook. But God is in the equation, right? At the end of 10 days, their features appeared better 
and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. So here's the mandate for vegetarianism. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No. It isn't necessarily. I mean, there's an element to it, but there are a couple things going on. The rest of the group is what we're wanting to focus on. The rest of the group is compromised. The rest of the group is eating unfamiliar food. The rest of the group probably knows they're breaking the Mosaic Law and they've got a guilty conscience. And when you have a guilty conscience, your countenance doesn't look too great, does it? Have you ever been there? You know that. Now, whether it's the, the flesh looks fatter if I don't have a guilty conscience, I don't have a guilty conscience. I mean, I feel pretty good today. <laughs> and it's like the idea of these guys in a visual comparison, if it comes down to their countenance, the guys who have a clear conscience are going to look more healthy. The guys who are struggling under the different food, the different diet, the mosaic law. I love bacon all of a sudden. I don't know what to do, but I can't get enough of that bacon. You're in, you're in the court of the king, right? And all of a sudden, but that begins to weigh on you. Now you're like, oh, I wonder what God thinks of me now. Do you see how that, that there's a very definite contrast between the two groups now. And in that, it was obvious to the head of the eunuchs. And he saw it, he's like, wow, it's unmistakable. All right, you guys are clear. And whether they're clear meant everybody else's diet changed, it isn't very, it isn't very clear in the text. It may have, but what we know is these four were in the clear and they could just eat the diet they chose. They weren't required to then drink the wine and to drink the or eat the meat. So they stuck to the veggies and the water. As for the four young men, this is interesting. If you purpose in your heart and you take a stand and you speak the heart of the Lord in a situation. So that's interesting. Sometimes we want to purpose in our heart and take a stand, but we're hesitant to speak. And the hesitancy to speak may mean nothing ever changes. And maybe if, if Daniel doesn't speak to the leader of the eunuchs, they're kind of they're kind of rolled, and there's never a distinction made. But they Daniel spoke, and sometimes we feel like as believers we're in a spot where, oh, should I say anything? Should I not? Should I? Shouldn't I? Maybe I don't want to cause waves. I, I don't want to be that Christian that's a little out there, you know, kind of that idea. Sometimes God puts us in a spot where you've got to say something, and as you say something not for your own, but for his sake, he honors you. And he honors you, and there's a blessing that's coming. And for these guys, the blessing is, um, God gave them knowledge. And, they, and he gave them skill in all the literature. All of a sudden, the literature was a snap. And he gave them great wisdom. And maybe they learned the language easily. And on top of that, Daniel, this is our hint at Daniel. Daniel had understanding in all visions and all dreams. So this is, again, a foreshadow of what's coming in the rest of the book. Because, you know, a third of the book is Daniel interpreting and having visions and dreams. Uh, a third to a half of it. So we already are told over in verse 5 that they had wisdom. There seems to be wisdom about them, but God gave them more wisdom. Uh, verse 4, wisdom. Now at the, end of, at the end of days, at the end of the three years, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. So the king interviewed them one after another, the whole group of Hebrew children. He interviewed them one after another. He's talking to him, asking him questions, challenging them. And among them, all of them, none was found like Daniel, 
Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. So these four were the cream of the crop. They rose to the top of the class. They set their course early. God blessed it throughout. And there was an abundance of God's blessing and favor on them. And what's going on for Daniel is God is going to use Daniel for the next 70 to 80 years in the next two great kingdoms in world history. It isn't a one-shot wonder with Daniel. It isn't a one-hit wonder. It's setting the course of his life. And it says, In all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found these 19-year-old, 18-year-old kids, young men, to be 10 times more wise, 10 times better in all things than the magicians, the astrologers, who were in all the realm of Babylon. That's incredible to me. But God is the difference in it because they've set their course and pursued the Lord and God's heart and God's character and God blesses it. And it's revealed to an unbelieving world. Being set apart for the sake of Christ, the world will see it. The world can recognize the difference. Jesus said we're to be salt and light. We're to cause people to be thirsty. We're to shed light on dark situations through the wisdom and the nature that God gives us. Does that happen regularly for you? Is it happening on a regular basis or is it uncommon? And I think if, if we're honest with ourselves, maybe it should be more common. Maybe I hesitate to say something. Maybe I'm compromising a little bit here and I don't ever see the opportunity to stand or to speak. And I, I want to encourage you that that setting your heart and purposing mentality can start at any time and that, let that be the beginning point of this older man at 49 purposed in his heart and from here on he's not going to take part in the king's delicacies of this world and he's going to stand and he's going to speak when the opportunity comes and I think it's just a mindset that it's okay whatever's past is past you can't go back but from here on Let's purpose in our heart and move forward in it and see what God will do. So Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus, which happened in 536 B.C. So Daniel continued in this life in the palace from one king to the next for 75 years. So the application, the, the reality of it, in my mind, I didn't even reference my notes, so... See what good they are at this point. But I want you to go to um, 1 Corinthians 1. And we'll see if we can kind of wrap it up and bring some, some New Testament clarity to what this all means for us. First Corinthians 1 talks about the message of the cross in verse 18 is foolishness to the world, to those who are perishing, it's foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. And there are a lot of, a lot of, uh, I mean, in the context of those wise men of Babylon, um, they held a lot of stock in how wise they were and their political machinery and surrounding the king. But the, the wisdom of God far surpasses the wisdom of men. So let's read a few verses here. Verse, let's go down to verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, and not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. In contrast, those kids, they were they said they were noble, they were of nobility, and they were already pretty wise as young men. Now, we may not be there. Maybe I feel like I don't have a lot of wisdom in me. Now, God says you can ask for wisdom and he'll give it to you liberally. But you've got to ask and you've got to desire it for his purposes, not just to be, oh, he's a really wise Christian, you know, like a seeking after a reputation of being a wise Christian. But you need wisdom to walk in this world. So in this, the foolishness of God is wiser 
than the wisdom of men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. Do you feel weak? Do you feel foolish? God's called you. He can use you to put to shame those who think they're wise in this world. Those who think they're mighty in this world, he can bring down through a humble servant who's an instrument of his wisdom, walking it out in humility before him. Don't feel like the pressure is on to perform, to look a certain way, because God says, I know you aren't. I know you can't. I want to, I want to be in that with you. So don't carry that burden of it. Now go to, let's see, let's go to James real quick. James chapter 3. Oh no, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 3. Now in terms of the original setting where they're taken hostage, it could have totally crippled them. What was me, my family, it's awful, horrible things happen, is God real? I'm blaming God, I'm taken from my home. That's real. People go through horrible things, even at a young age. But does that negate the reality of God in their life? Does that negate the reality that God has a plan for them and can still work things for them, for the good? Look in uh, chapter 3, uh, 1 Peter 3, and we'll start in maybe verse 12. This is quoting This is quoting the psalm, but we'll pick up the last verse of it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So if terrible things happen, comfort yourself. God is his eyes are on you, he sees it. And he hears you crying out in pain and sorrow. He hears that. He understands what's going on with the evildoer. And now the application from Peter. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? If you set your course like Daniel did and you're like, I'm going to walk this out. I'm going to purpose. I'm going to set the course this way. It might not come with good circumstances. It might actually come with some pain. Now, in Daniel's story, it was pretty radical, but oftentimes it maybe isn't. Maybe there's a challenge and a, you can bail out right now before a lot of pain comes. But God says, walk with me and I'll walk you through the pain. So this is where Peter's at. Even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you've got to remember you're blessed. Don't be afraid of their threats nor be troubled, but then here's the key verse, here's the key word sanctify, set him apart, set yourself apart from the things of this world, the mentality of this world, the course of this world, be set apart. Set the Lord God in your heart, sanctify him. Now I have a note that that Lord God, it's like set, sanctify him as Lord, as Lord of your heart. There's a difference between he's my savior as an insurance policy and he's my Lord and I'm going to do what he says to do. There, there's kind of a gap. Some people live over in the he's just my savior insurance policy but he wants to walk with you and direct you and instruct you in all the ways that he wants to take you through life. Now if you've done the he is also Lord not just savior but also as Lord in my life Now, even the suffering is, brings comfort. Even in the suffering, he's there. And it's a distinction. Not only that, always be ready to give a defense. Be ready to speak. Be ready to explain what's going on. How do you understand life? How do you perceive things that are happening? Because if suffering comes, people will ask. 
if the distinction is made, people will wonder because now you're different. You're the fish going upstream. Everybody else is going downstream. The phrase is that any old dead fish can float downstream, right? It takes a live one to head upstream. You ever watch salmon run? Salmon don't have legs so they don't run, but salmon, the salmon runs in, in Oregon. We, we see those sometimes on the rivers. And they'll, just, they'll, they'll hop like rock waterfalls. They'll just like keep gutting it out and going and going because they've got to get back to the place they started. Sam runs kind of a, any old fish can float downstream. It takes a live one to go against the flow. And this is the idea. Going against the flow, you become obvious. Everyone's like, what's up with that guy? You become obvious. You're different from the rest of the world. And now you're salt and light. Now you're being a witness. And in that, people are going to ask you, and are you ready to give a defense, to give an answer? for the reason of the hope that lies within you. So do you have a hope that lies within you? Is it consistent in your walking it out? Do you know how to explain your testimony? Those kinds of things. And with meekness and fear, you're going to respond to people. And this goes back to the children of Israel, that they had a good, a good conscience. So the parallel back to Daniel 1, these guys had a good conscience. They had a clear conscience. They were able to speak. They had a course, and God was with them. They were going against the grain. God was blessing. God was with them. They spoke, and they have a hope. They have an intended end that they know. My goal is not to please this king. My goal is to please the Lord, right? And even if they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ, they're going to be ashamed. For it's better, if it is the will of God, it's, it's better to suffer for doing good than to simply go and do evil and face the consequences of that. So we have a choice, right? We can compromise and go with the flow and face consequences for sin that will ultimately come. Or we can set our course and purpose to walk it out, come what may, and even if it means suffering for Christ, this is, the, this is the better route. Are we all on board with that? This is the better route. Let's, let's purpose in our hearts. Let's walk out what God calls us to. Let's be ready to take a stand and speak. And it'll look different for everybody. We're in different worlds. We're in different circles. But what I'll tell you is you'll know when that moment comes, I need to speak. And if I don't, I'm drawing back in compromise. And when you need to speak, you need to speak with gentleness because you're representing Christ. You're an ambassador. But man, you're going to be set apart. You're going to be looking like the, the wild fish going upstream and everybody's flying downstream past you. I want to, I want to, I want to conquer the river going upstream. And I would say the reality of, is he the Lord of your life? Is he your Savior? Has he forgiven your sins? Are you his? Is the starting point, right? Because outside of a relationship with Christ, none of this is possible. You're going to be floating downstream. So if you're not a believer, I would highly recommend seeking his forgiveness, asking him to be Lord of your life and uh, he won't turn you away. A humble and contrite heart he will not cast out. So if you come to him in humility he'll receive you gladly. So let's pray a little bit shorter today but we'll just, we'll cut it there. I feel like that's what God has for us. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for an example of uh, bold, brave, godly young men that can encourage us to walk it out in our lives, in our age, in, in our season of life here. Lord, we, we want to walk it out in a way that honors you, that glorifies you, and Lord, that we're not um, bending to the will, conforming to the 
circumstance or culture around us, but that we're set apart, sanctified for your purposes, prepared for whatever may come because you're with us and you're in it. And uh, we just pray as we go that you would touch our pastor, Lord, that you would heal him, that you would restore his strength. Give him great encouragement today, Lord, and bless him. And Lord, thank you for the time in your word. Thank you for your love, Lord, in Jesus' name.